of you I've talked to on the phone, or at least emailed back, I'm Jim Gleason, and a member of our Second Chance Heart Transplant Support Group. And it's so great to see you all. And there are so many special stories in this room, and some of us have had a chance to talk about that back and forth. So let me just say right up front, congratulations to everybody. And that includes the caregivers who have survived even tougher times sometimes than us heart recipients, right? One of the things that uh, I know we never take for granted, but I just want to share a story. The team here is just amazing, and I deal with the teams in all the hospitals as part of our support stuff, and so I'm not saying that lightly. Uh, wherever you get transplanted, I mean, that's where God was. We know that, and so that's the best place in the world. But I gotta tell you, uh, they watch over you so closely here. A couple years ago, uh, I developed a condition locally, ended up in the hospital, they said, we gotta put you in the hospital. I said, no, no, I go down to Huff. And they had to collaborate with the team while they were treating me out there. And so they ambulanced me down here at 2 a.m. in the morning, okay? You know, I go to an ER at 2 a.m. in the morning. I didn't. Went right through, up to a room. I was no sooner in that room than the heart team was at the bedside at 2 a.m. in the morning for a non-heart condition. I mean, they're looking after your success. And one other story I love, I was bringing a bunch of stuff up to Deb Gordon for a meeting, and I had a 50-pound box I was hauling in. By the time I got to her office, I was out of breath. Okay? And she was concerned about that. I said, don't worry about it. I'll catch up. And Sally was right there. You sure you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. No, 50 extra pounds. Three days later, I get a call right, from one of the nurses who said, I heard that you were out of breath, and I've been tracking you down. They tracked me down at a restaurant where I was at a lunch to make sure I was okay. That's the kind of care we get here. And I can't say thank you enough to the social workers, to the medical team, to the nurses, everybody that's here. So thank you for them too. I just let you know, we are recording this event today. If anybody says something, you say, Jim, I don't want that on recording, I can edit it out, just tell me, okay? It's not a big deal. But this will be part of a transplant presentation library that the local TRIO chapter and TRIO National maintains and offers to its members. And we have 48 programs out there, which this is number 48. So if you're interested in that, see me later on, but let's move right on and just introduce our topic today. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to our great doctors who are going to talk about the research side of things that we benefit from. So, if you will. Good morning, and thanks so much for coming out. It's, um, I can't tell you what a privilege it is to see everyone together in a room like this and a lot of familiar faces instead of uh, in the hospital or in the clinic. And it's just a real, a, a real pleasure for us. So, what we wanted to do was just give a very brief talk, but then spend most of the time just answering questions, you know, having a real conversation about things on your mind as they relate to uh, heart failure and transplant research. Um, and in fact, we, when we were on our way in, we were looking at this slide and um, we, we thought about just changing to heart failure research, why it matters, and how you have already helped. Uh, because many of you have participated in important research studies which have, have moved the field forward and improved our ability to, to deliver better care. So, I just have a few slides. You may have heard this week that Joseph Murray, who uh, won the Nobel Prize, uh, died a few days ago. And in 1954, he performed the first uh, organ transplant, it was a kidney transplant, from um, a brother to his twin brother who were suffering from uh, renal failure, and this was before the days of dialysis. And this gave birth to a field, it was a success story that through lots of labor and effort and research over many years, eventually led to other organ transplants, including heart. So it's a very timely thing to consider, but the thing that's important to me is, you know, there have been a lot of recorded interviews with Dr. Murray uh, on the radio, and this was the thing that stuck with me. He wasn't thinking about being famous or, or uh, you know, doing, running a successful lab or anything like that. He was just trying to do his job, which was taking care of the patients. And, and that was the bottom line. And when we come to work every day, whether in the clinic or in the research world, that is what drives us. And um, so I think research and clinical care are really inseparable. Everything that you have undergone with all the risks and potential benefits they have, they have arisen through research. Um, 
So with that, I, I just wanted to give you a couple examples of some research that you have already helped with at Penn. I'll give an example, and then uh, Ken will give an example. And then we can just chat and answer your, any questions you have. So we have many, many different research programs here to help us learn about heart failure, learn about heart transplantation, and improve the success of heart transplantation. Uh, here's one example, and this was an example that I was fortunate enough to uh, help lead. This was a study now that began in, I think, 2001 or 2002, where we were collecting extra blood samples at the time you underwent your heart biopsies. And we were trying to explore whether we could find a better way to diagnose transplant rejection that wouldn't require a heart biopsy. And we used new technologies, new gene expression technologies. And this was just an idea at the time, was actually initiated by a fellow, one of our fellows, Phil Horowitz. And he collected all these samples and we performed an analysis and we, we found that, well, you could find things in the blood that correlated with the biopsy and that suggested that maybe we could avoid some biopsies. And this, was how, this is how research starts. It starts out with an idea and someone just trying something. Uh, so that's sort of chapter one. There are about 10 other chapters in between, but you may have heard uh, and participated in the image study. How many people here were in the image study? Anyone? Do you remember this study? This was a study where we collected extra blood and used a gene expression test and you either got assigned to use of the gene expression test or not use of the gene expression test. You were in that study, yeah, yeah. And the study actually showed that under certain circumstances, the gene expression test was good enough and that we could avoid biasing certain patients. And, and this is how the field moves forward. Someone has an idea, they try it out, they test it, many other people get involved. Uh, importantly, uh, we work with you to help answer these questions. You know, it's always a joint adventure to see, well, if this is a good idea, here are the risks, here are the benefits, let's give it a try, maybe it'll work. And that's how progress is made. And so now we have a commercially available test called Alumap, which under certain circumstances can uh, reduce the number of biopsies. Now my sense is that everyone here has passed the biopsy window anyway, but people who are now newly transplanted really appreciate this because, you know, they don't have to undergo as many biopsies. And that's how progress is made. And, and so first I want to thank you for helping us do this type of research, but this is just but one example of uh, how progress is made. And it's a real privilege to be part of it. And um, Dr. Margulies uh, has some other examples that, that he is going to highlight, and then we can open it up for questions and answers. Happy to participate. Thank you all for coming. And um, again, as, as will be clear, I'll present one story that I've been involved with. I was at Temple for 11 years, about eight years ago, and see a lot of familiar faces in the room from both eras. And I, I can honestly say that the human heart tissue research that many people in this room have enabled has sort of made my career. And at the same time, I do think it's allowed us to make some contributions to the field. And uh, though it's probably not the first time, uh, I want to again take this opportunity to thank you. The, um, one of the stories, and, and there's quite a number, and I'll highlight at the end, the types of different research and the types of different attributes that human heart tissue research provide that no other discovery or, or research technique uh, allows. Uh, one of the stories has been this sort of LVAD recovery story. Let me highlight that. So how many people in this room had an LVAD before they got transplanted? Okay, so most of you, uh, and, and pretty much, and how many people donated tissue for heart research, either in my lab or some others? An awful lot, right? And so, again, this is a shared report on our efforts combined. Um, as a matter of fact, of the people we have approached in the 18 years that we've been doing this, we get about a 99% uh, participation rate in human heart tissue studies. So, yeah, so, sorry, 99% participation rate. So this has been an extremely generous uh, uh, effort on your behalf to support this kind of line of research. So one of the stories is that we were putting in these left ventricular assist devices that purposely shown a cartoon with one of the uh, early generation ventricular assist devices, uh, a cartoon reflecting the HeartMate 1. Uh, we have better devices now, but even this one provided a couple of interesting things that proved very useful. Number one is everybody getting these devices had uh, 
life-sustaining circulatory support because they were dying on the waiting list without it. And number two is that it produced quite a bit of heart unloading and deactivation of the hormonal systems that are, were believed to contribute to the progression of heart failure. So if anything was going to induce a recovery or remission, if you will, this type of support might do it. And the other important thing it provided is these paired transmural, so full thickness heart tissue specimens. When the VAD went in, the core of tissue came out. When the patient finally got transplanted, then the rest of the heart came out. We had two pieces of tissue uh, from the same patient at two different times, and that's pretty unique in medicine. Most people don't want to give up big chunks of their heart. In this case, it's part of the care of the patient, and it provided a wonderful opportunity to say, when these end-stage hearts reach this sort of point that they need this kind of support, are they really completely fried, or is there any potential for recovery? That was the question. Um, it turns out that when you do an echocardiogram on somebody on a VAD, it's hard to interpret the pre and post VAD echo because the conditions are so different. This unloading makes the usual measurements like ejection fraction kind of unreliable. Ejection fraction is very load dependent. So the, we found that if we were going to address this right, we actually had to study the hearts at the tissue level, the piece of tissue we got before, the piece after, and make it a fair fight, a fair comparison between the two. And so that's what we did. The most important data <coughs> slide of, of a lot are two papers that got published consecutively in 1998 um, that got a lot of attention. They each were cited about 400 times now. Um, that showed first function that these are, these are shortening profiles. So basically what's happening here is this is a normal, this is from a, a donor heart, from, from gift of life, uh, from an unused donor. And this is my isolated myocyte contraction. And basically, a, the bigger the excursion downward is how much the cell shortened. And the faster it happens is also a sign of healthiness. So a healthy, normal cardiac myocyte, heart muscle cell from an individual with a normal heart, um, beats like this. It shortens fast and long, you know, it, you know, big extent of shortening, and it relaxes fast. And ones from failing hearts have less shortening and a much slower one, and ones from LVAD ones are intermediate. And that lesson came through in lots of different ways. So this is emblematic of the functional response. The data down here is emblematic of the, function, of the structural response, which means when you look at hundreds of myocytes from these hearts, in general, big hearts that are sick hearts get enlarged individual muscle cells, and when they get supported by one of these devices, they go about halfway back to normal. That's the average response. So we get this signature of partial recovery that showed up in lots and lots of different studies. There are literally hundreds of papers that have done comparisons of failing versus non-failing versus LVAD, LVAD supported hearts. And the LVAD ones typically fall somewhere in the middle, sometimes more dramatically in the middle and sometimes only slightly in the middle. But there's definitely some improvement that occurs. And this summarizes the different levels of support. The bottom line is even end-stage failing human hearts it exhibits substantial structural and functional plasticity with potent reverse remodeling stimuli. And the field has gone forward, just like Dr. Coppola mentioned with the initial study saying, wow, we really can see that the lymphocytes have some reflection of what's going on in the heart with respect to rejection. Here we have the heart muscle cells giving us some reflection of what, what might be going on in the heart with respect to improvements in contractility. And how can we build on that in this stage? So there's ongoing trials to find out which of the patients who are exhibiting enough recovery at the clinical level that we actually can explant their devices. Each year uh, in Europe or here, about 10 to 15 percent of people who got a VAD thinking they would need it long term or all the way to take them to transplant um, get their devices explanted um, because either there's some infection that forces the issue or more commonly lately because they seem to have enough recovery that their myocarditis settled down or whatever the cause was, things settled down enough and there's enough recovery. And I think your contributions and our work and many other people's work, as Tom mentioned, have contributed to a proof of principle that, hey, recovery can occur even in the sickest of sick hearts. And we ought to be looking for it. And if it does happen, we ought to recognize it and consider not uh, committing the person to either transplant or to, uh, uh, or to long-term device therapy if that's really feasible. And so I think that's another exciting area. It doesn't impact every single patient getting VADs. It impacts a subset of them. But what was, I think, what, what felt to be unheard of uh, 15 years ago is, is now happening regularly, just not as often as we want. And research goes on to say, well, maybe we need extra drugs or other things to make it happen more often. But like everything, 
Uh, you get interim stages in progress, but progress continues on no matter what. The newer, de develop, uh, the newer devices are better uh, at, at allowing recovery uh, in terms of being explantable. These older devices, that, like the one in the cartoon there, uh, a bear to take out if it's not part of a transplant. The newer devices are somewhat easier to take out. So progress continues. Um, I just want to at least highlight that, that you've heard about two little stories, right? You've heard about the, uh, the, the non-invasive uh, diagnosis of rejection story, a little bit about the left ventricular assist device recovery story. Story. There's lots of other things that the things you've contributed, the hearts you've contributed, and other specimens that are constantly seeing. And they're highlighted here. So human tissue studies are used in a variety of different ways in my lab and others. Um, we're active in all of these areas, whether it's isolated cells, uh, like you've heard about here, the blood cells that helped us uh, learn about non-invasive diagnosis of rejection, or whether it's isolated myocytes or muscle strips that helped us learn about myocardial recovery, it's in the top two. But we have other things that have come up uh, that we take some pieces and keep them in the freezer for things that uh, come along, projects that come along later when we get a little bit smarter about what the cutting edge issues are. And when those issues come along, we can delve into our well-organized freezer, and all of your names are stripped from these, but we can still have characteristics that help us know which samples go in which groups and use those to address new questions. Dr. Coppola and I have a new very big discovery effort, uh, effort focusing on gene expression profiling and its relation to genetics and with sparing the technical uh, particulars of that, it is uniquely big, uniquely high quality and uniquely um, likely to lead to new discoveries of targets for therapy for uh, heart failure, and I think it'll be a tremendous resource. And again, the only reason we were able to do it is 99% of you who were transplanted at, at our institutions gave your hearts for not just projects we told you about, but if something else comes along that's good, you need the permission to use it for those things. And again, I thank you for that ongoing contribution. So it lives, your contributions have already borne fruit, but continue to bear fruit, and there may be new projects in years to come that I don't have the imagination to think of today that will still probably uh, make a difference. So um, I'm going to stop there, just highlight one last thing that, you know, what, what things that are special about heart tissue research. Nobody ever complains that it's not clinically relevant. You can do a lot of mouse studies or cell culture studies or other things, and it came from a human being's heart, it's relevant. Number two is that we're all different. We don't, mice are bred to be the same, but humans happen to be very different, and in a way this type of research celebrates that differences, and anything that shows up in spite of that variability is usually robust and usually a, a, an important thing to discover. And it allows us to develop applications like you heard of with the Alamap or recovery trial, and sometimes we do need to go back to mice or cell culture or other more reductionist uh, techniques, but Dr. Capola and I are of the feeling that it should be the human tissue research that tells you which questions merit that kind of um, approach, as opposed to the other way around saying, gee, I found this in a mouse, I wonder if it matters in humans. We believe if you find it in humans, then it's worth studying in other model systems, uh, because it's happened in humans in the first place. So it's a different type of research. I think we both share this philosophy and are trying to do more and more things in keeping with that philosophy. So once again, I thank you very much for coming to attend this and for uh, hearing us out here and for your participations, uh, you know, long before this talk. So uh, let me offer you one suggestion. As people have questions, we're going to ask the presenters to repeat the question so everybody hears it clearly. We've learned that from the past <coughs> things like this. So if you would, sure. and if I may start off with a question I've heard from many, to the explanted part, the whole talk some tissue here, but by the time the transplant is over, could you give us a trail of where it went? Yeah. Ah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay. So, what, so as part of getting a heart transplant, with or without a bad beforehand, the heart has to come out. It has to be dissected out by a professional surgeon, as you all had done. That um, our surgeons here do one extra step that wouldn't ordinarily have to be done as part of a transplant. They give cardioplegia, that's a heart protecting solution that they would use in any bypass surgery or any valve surgery. If the heart was just going in the bucket to pathology, it wouldn't get that. But if it's going to be used for research, it has to be protected, so it's high quality. And that extra step has enabled everything we've done. That it turns out the only reason we're one of the sites that could do this 
um, uh, later uh, thought of gene expression study is that our surgeons take the extra care to give the cardioprotective solution to a heart that doesn't otherwise need it to enable our research. It makes all the difference. Otherwise, the heart literally beats itself to death. And so that's the most important step. The rest of it is laboratory-based stuff. So the heart comes out after being pleached or protected in, in the body. The surgeon continues on with their dissection. When the heart is completely out, we have somebody from our lab waiting with an ice-cold bucket of protective solution, they bring it back to our lab, and they put it through a series of steps. Sometimes it's cell isolation steps, sometimes it's just taking small pieces and putting them in the freezer. Uh, we have a research assistant who also comes and gets the clinical data from your chart to, to know who had ischemic cardiomyopathy versus non-ischemic versus congenital versus valvular, whatever your cause was, we want to put it in the right bin. Um, we know what medicines you were on at the time, we collect all this clinical data and then we strip your identity from the case because the only thing we needed your identity for was to get into your chart to get that data. But once we have that data, it's not in your interest or our interest to have the tissue samples or the data linked to you. If some, you know, I don't want to affect anybody's insurability, I don't want to affect anything moving forward, but, you know, give due credit at times like this, but other than that, you're, you're kept anonymous. After we get that linked data, we unlink it from the identity. And that's very important. And it turns out that's insisted upon by all of the IRB uh, and other oversight committees, and, and, and we've been very compliant with that throughout. In terms of what happens to it beyond, so some people, some studies get used for experiments that night, some, some tissues or cells or whatever we got. Some are put in the freezer, some are put in cell culture, and, you know, they, and, and the ones in the freezer are available for years to come. The heart Not the whole heart, just pieces. The rest of the heart goes to pathology. So another, another group that's been indulgent to us uh, over the years, not just the patients who have donated and the surgeons who have helped us uh, protect the hearts so they're high quality for research, is the pathologists. And typically, at many institutions, pathologists get the heart right away. Now, they might not do anything right away. It may sit out on some counter there for a long time. They said, look, if you're going to all the trouble to wake up in the middle of the night to get this heart, do research, we ask that you do a few things. Just weigh it, don't over-harvest, and then give us whatever's left at the end. And then we've obliged that. Um, and uh, then they can still do a pathologic reading. So any case, whether it's a cancer being removed or any, anything that happens in the operating room, typically generates a surgical pathology report. And so when we've taken our samples to suit the, the research purposes we have, we leave enough behind, quite enough behind to go to uh, surgical pathology. Yeah. Um, Deborah Kerman, two years after transplant. Yes. Um, are you saying that you can determine whether or not your condition, the condition of your heart, was congenital or viral? We, I think that could happen in the future. It's not been the major focus of our research to, to develop a, a diagnosis where it hasn't been made clinically. Okay. Um, there are growing ways to, to, to do that, so in, and we have a new sector in our program, right? We have Dr. Owens who's leading a hereditary cardiomyopathy program. In general, because when it's genetically determined, the same genes are in all the cells in our body, including blood cells, you don't actually have to take a heart out to make a diagnosis of a genetic cardiomyopathy. The same genes would be reflected in a peripheral blood sample. So although it's something you could do with, with hearts, it's not really the major focus of our research. The focus of the research that I mentioned, that I alluded to, is that all of us are different, and sometimes those differences can result in natural experiments. The variation can allow you to pinpoint genes that are, when they're varied, they affect the, ex the gene expression, and that's really the important focus. In terms of genetic diagnosis, it's not what we're doing. Yeah. Some of your research gen gender-specific women, men, is the in use, yeah, um, we, we, there's many questions. Yeah, we've had um, at least three papers from my lab that have identified differences in either contractility or heart structure, heart muscle cell structure, um, or drug responses in response in, that are that are gender different. Um, 
And so, yes, some of it is. It's not been the only focus of our research, but it's come along. Again, one of the reasons we collect all those patient characteristics, so it's a great case in point because it's not a question I had a priori, but when there was some interest in the field, is there any data that the human hearts are different from people? Because we saw this mouse study that said they are, that there's gender differences. So we explored it in our bank tissue and we found differences. So yes, there we contributed to that. Yes? Yeah. Oh, well you can imagine, if a pathologist wants to make a diagnosis, they want to see both the growth, the, the, the gross pathology of the heart, the valves in their proper places, and the muscle in its proper places, and the epicardium, the surface of the heart, you know, things in their proper anatomic position. In people with congenital heart disease, that's especially important, but in, even in run-of-the-mill hearts, if we over-distort or over-sample over the heart in our re for our research purposes and leave them with nothing but tiny fragments, then well, they okay. can't do their job right. So it means, you know, leaving, taking what we need, but not being too greedy that we compromise their ability to do their job. Yeah. Yeah. I recently read an article in the New York Times about stem cell, where they're taking heart stem cell and building tissue to fix damaged hearts after mild heart attacks. Is that true? Is this in it, it, it is true. Um, there's uh, a several, so it's a, it's, a, it's a big area. Trying to figure out where the role, you know, so let, let's talk about regenerative cardiology broadly, right? There's, there's an effort to say, wouldn't it be nice? There are some hearts that recovery isn't enough. They just lost too much of their heart cells. And so even if the ones that are remaining are working better with LDADs or some other medicine approach, they've just lost a critical mass of heart cells. Can we replace them? So there's several different lines of research in that. One line of research is, is, it, is there some re native repair going on that we've missed? And that actually there's some low level process of native repair like we do with our skin or many other organs in our body that's going on in the heart. We've just missed it because it happened so well. We've, my lab has been particularly interested in that and the bottom line of that research to my interpretation is there is. It's low level and it's not enough. But, but that there's some element of native repair going on and there's various different particular factors that modulate that, but in general it's insufficient. Now it doesn't, insufficient usually is the kind of thing we work on. You know, maybe we have to find out why is it insufficient and can we make it better. So that's a line of research in my lab and others. Another is that there have been advances in the ability to reprogram, well, cells from other parts of the body, whether it's from the bone marrow or from the skin, and turn them into uh, stem cells that in turn can turn into cardiac myocytes and populate the heart. So that's cell therapy. Where we're saying, let's take a cells that we got from either another person's body or your own body, let's modify it in the laboratory and give it back to you in a way that might enable regeneration. And those types of trials have been done and are ongoing, and it's a very rapidly evolving field. I think there's some of the more recent trials that have tantalizing results in terms of 10% improvement in ejection fractions, things like that. But a lot of them are small, and some of them are not blinded, and there's a potential for bias there. So the jury's out, to be honest, about whether they're as good as they appear to be. There's actually a, there's a, there's a, I just wanted to follow up on that. There's a broader point to be made about research in general. So you can read a lot on the internet, in the newspaper, about the latest cool thing that's out there, the latest science we have to offer. But as, as patients and as doctors, we, we partner with the patients and we are careful about the research that we will offer. And there are, in general, two types of research. There's observational research, where we ask, can we learn from you without doing anything to you? You know, taking your heart, studying your heart. If the heart was coming out, right? You were probably happy to see it go at the time. <laughs> um, or take a blood sample, learn from that. That doesn't really expose you to risk. When we're talking about an intervention, we're going to do something to you as a, as a, to see whether it makes you better. That's a different level. So injecting stem cells into, you, into your heart, exposing you to an operation or a device that you would not have experienced otherwise. That is a real partnership with our patients. We need your help to help sort out which things work or not. But we have to do it carefully and with a true partnership. You can go and find doctors out there who will 
treat you with stem cells or treat you with a certain drug. But the evidence supporting that treatment isn't there yet. So that's when we really have to have a long discussion and, and develop a trust about what is the new thing that's worth trying and what is the right way to try it. And there are clinical trials that are well regulated by the government, by our institutional review boards, by the FDA, and those are the, by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and those are the ones you want to get involved in, where there's oversight and where there's real hope that this might work, but we just don't know yet, as opposed to looking around and, you know, I've, I've had patients come in and they've wanted to go abroad to get treatments outside of the context of, of trials. If you want to try something new, you should try it in the context of a trial with the partnership of your physicians. And that can be transformative. That's how things like kidney transplants have happened and heart transplants have happened. But, you know, any new thing has some risk, so it has to be really considered. Does that make sense? Yeah. May I follow up, may I follow up yeah. on something that you just said? Now, you talked about going out of the country. Mm -hmm. I'm a volunteer down the family house here in Philadelphia, and people like down the house. And we're starting to see an awful lot of patients coming in from Saudi Arabia for transplant here in the United States. Why would you say that? That's an interesting question. Uh, for a heart transplant? Well, they're coming in for lungs, they're coming in yeah. for kidneys. Uh, I know of at least three people right now that are waiting for lung transplants, and they're from Saudi Arabia. Yeah. Another family that was here for three months waiting for a lung transplant, and then they had to go back to Saudi Arabia, and they're coming back next month. Um, yeah. And they're waiting for lung transplants. So this is, this is an interesting question. My guess is that these are people of means who can afford to move here. And you know, when we're doc as doctors, we will treat anyone. You know, anyone who has who's sick and needs our help, we will treat them. And the way the world is, people with means have more opportunity. They're coming over through the embassy. Through their embassy. <coughs> through their embassy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe, maybe. Did you have any insight into this for heart transplant, Devin? Sally. I think that they have to get. Um, I mean, they're working through the embassy because they need visas to be can't come into the country without a visa. And there are different types of visas that they would get, they would have to go to our embassy to get. But I think we also have to limit them to the number of non-citizen transplants that occur in each program. And I don't know the specific limit. I tell you, there's no such limit to any program. Right. Well, there's no such limit to any program, of course, can settle them. And in general, the reports show that about the same number of donations are made by foreign nationals as they are receiving. But there is no rule to that. It's quite well discussed at UNIS board meetings last year. And so there are no rules. There's been recommendations, but they're very clear. This is not a rule. So individual programs can do whatever they want. I, uh, I had a meeting with Dr. Merritt early on. And he's dedicated his life to cardiomyopathy, and I wonder how much sharing of information they're willing to do with you all, and that specialty has focused his whole life on that. Which doctor, I'm sorry. Marin, met at the Minnesota yeah. Uh, yeah. Institute. Yeah. With, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, so the question asked was how much sharing is there among I, I, don't, I don't know if you get, you know, this is ours, we're, we're going to keep it, we're going we're gonna to bring it to the world, and we'll tell you about it when we're done. I, there is a diversity of um, behaviors with respect to sharing of precious research resources. Um, I am particularly proud, probably more proud of this than any other thing we've done, is that we have shared tissues from our patients and get consent to share with others, as long as it's for meritorious re research that's reviewed by the IRB, with probably 40 different labs outside the U.S., another five in Europe. Um, pretty much anyone who asks with a meritorious question, we take a subsample of, uh, of, of 
donated tissues that match their question. We don't sort of open up the whole freezer and say, take it all, because that wouldn't be being a good steward of the research. But we have shared for meritorious questions with dozens of labs. And this big project we're talking about with the expression profiling, et cetera, is going to be posted and the, you know, all of the data will be posted and a biorepository is being set up. So one of the, probably our biggest contribution when it's all said and done, will be setting up this biorepository and data repository that will allow anybody to come mine in it. To answer your question more fully, since you asked, is Dr. Marin sharing, uh, is in science fiction, no, to the extent that people publish, of course they share. And the current regulations or guidelines uh, about publication includes they need to full, fully disclose all the raw data for, let's say, gene expression analyses and post that in searchable sites. Um, and yet, people being people, there'll be matters of degree in terms of how fully and openly they share. I can tell you that, you know, we're proud to say that, that we've been, I think by anybody's standards, very generous sharers of de-identified data. So without people's identities involved. I have no doubt about that. I was just wondering about the others. And I think I, I, it's variable. I, don't, I can't give you a specific answer about Dr. Marin. Um, but the shortage of resources that are going to be coming, the idea of communicating and working more, sharing a team is very important. institutions by, by the way, the other, one. you know, one of the nice things about this sort of research is at least as far as the tissue being donated and the resource being created, it's actually not very expensive. It's your generosity. You live with these arts, you, you know, but, but it, it's actually hasn't been, it's not costly to share. It's cheap to share. And, and it, it's been a big win, you know, for many people's career to share. So I think people are getting the message and trying to be more open, and that's the general ethic with, let's say, gene, gene expression data and things like that. It gets posted much more than, than not, um, but people are people. Just to put a finer point on the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute and the NIH now mandate sharing. If your research is funded by them, you have to share. So if you use their dollars to generate data, you have to share it, period. If you use their dollars to generate even a mouse model uh, that's uh, supposed to reflect a human model, if people call you up and ask for that, you need to send them the model. So it is now mandated. That's one trend. Another trend is that there, there's, there's no surprise. Any academic, there's a dusty, stodgy aspect to any university academic endeavor. And that is being broken down by the concept of team science. You may have heard this now. There used to be, you know, the one leader of the program. You can see there are two people up here talking. More and more research programs now have multiple leaders who work as a team. And they bring different points of view, different skill sets to bear on the same question. And that is a, the newer funding model now. So I think that's another trend that will help share resources and help share knowledge. But you're right to point out that there, there has historically been a tension. I have, to ask you, I have to ask you a question. On the lighter side, the two of you have mentioned the word freezer numerous times today. How big is the freezer? <laughs> <laughs> well, right down the hall. I mean, how big I mean, is the freezer? Is this big? Yeah. There's several. I mean, so there are these minus 80 degree freezers. Yeah, they have multiple levels of backup. They have a generator backup. They have a CO2 backup. They, have, they, they bring my pager. If they have an interruption of, of energy, you might imagine we have an awful lot of uh, you know effort at stake in there. So uh, we never had a freezer mishap, and uh, uh, but but there's a, a series of them, and they're all backed up, and they, they, you know they're the size of a of the biggest freezer you could get in your house, but they're not any bigger than that. They're not they're not walk-in freezers. <laughs> It has. In fact, it, it's gone a lot of places. The question is whether 
whether it works when cells like that are administered, whether they last, so most, or, or more primitive versions that might continue to differentiate into beating heart cells. So we can do that in our lab here. We do that in our labs here. Um, we can engraft them into rodents, but then to determine whether they last and contribute to the beating of the whole heart once engrafted is a much tougher question. Yeah, that's not going anywhere. So, and this brings up another general trend. When there's a new discovery in science, you'll read it on the front page of the New York Times, and its impact is always overstated. It's just human nature, right? We want to believe. The press wants to believe. We all want to hope. But it takes years of careful work to sort out what is the real impact. And that's a good example. Oh my God. Researchers have made a heart in a dish. And, and you know, we're still sorting out whether anything even close to that has a chance of work. It just takes a long time. Anybody know how many cells there are in heart? That's what? six million. Not, how many cells in a human heart? Not that big, but about seven billion. So and then they've all got to be together and it's, it's tough to build a heart. Familial cardiomyopathies. This is a good question. So what is the question? Do we do research on familial cardiomyopathies, inherited risk for cardiomyopathy? And this is a big question. The answer is that there are, yes. Um, Dr. Anjali Owens has established a whole clinic focusing on familial cardiomyopathies and screening families to see what is their risk for familial cardiomyopathies. The problem we have is we don't fully understand how to do it perfectly. We know some of the inherited gene mutations that can lead to cardiomyopathy, and, some, and those tests are available clinically. Uh, but we only get an answer about a third of the time. Uh, the rest of the time we don't know and can't properly screen. But over time, this is, the, this is one of the fields that has had steady advancement and will continue to advance. So I would expect that the screening for familial risk of for inherited cardiomyopathy will get better. <coughs> It takes a lot of sitting down and mapping through the family history to really understand what the pattern is. And we actually have a genetic counselor in Dr. Owens' clinic who can help with that. So if you'd like, I don't know if you, if you have seen Dr. Owens or if one of your family members would like to assess their risk, that's something, that's a clinical thing that we would be happy to provide. So maybe you should make a note of it. Can you comment on the uh, continuing use of injection medication for the research going on in her, or advancements of the nation? Yes. So this is an example. It's a first, it's a good question. The question was, what research is going on to advance uh, the use and knowledge about transplant rejection medication? 
and there is a consortium sponsored by the NIH called the CTOP Consortium, Clinical Trials of Organ Transplantation. And the whole goal of this consortium is to bring together transplant centers and test new ideas for preventing transplant rejection. Um, we actually have several clinical trials ongoing now exploring whether earlier use of uh, newer anti-rejection medicines to induce uh, immunocompetence early on will prevent rejection later. So most of the action right now is in newly transplanted patients. Once you've shown tolerance and you're further out, there are a variety of agents I don't think we have any active clinical trials in that setting, but the newest bed of knowledge is really early on. And we do, and this is a good example of a trial that we are approaching all of our newly listed transplant patients for. The CTOT trials, do you want to be in the CTOT study? Well, what is the CTOT study? Well, it's a study asking whether if we use this extra medicine now, will it reduce the risk of rejection later? And that's a perfect, uh, example of an interventional study, right, it's a new drug, but one that's worth really considering because it's an unknown question and it might benefit you. It might not. We don't know. So we need your help to sort it out. So there is an active effort. Most of it's focused on um, newly transplanted patients. So how can we help you now with research on that? Yeah. So, so how can you help? Well, I think what you can do is broadly when you meet patients who are considering an advanced therapy, whether it's transplant or bad, you can tell them your own experience with research if you've had any. Was it a good experience? You know, what did it offer? What were the results of it? Um, but I would try to convey the message that you're in a field where research and clinical care are almost side by side. And you should be open to that because that's how we learn. You know, that's how we had transplant to begin with. That's so we had every drug that you're on now was the product of research. Um, so I think projecting comfort with the idea of research or telling patients your own personal experiences being in trials uh, would be very helpful. Or the, or the human heart tissue study, the observational research, that we've actually learned a lot from that effort and. Um, and they should have comfort that, um, that any uh, contribution they make is, it, it will be made in good faith and that we'll really try to do something. The contribution is different than patients, not from us that have already... Now, tr trials vary. There, there are, um, we currently don't have any active clinical trials for patients who are further out, but we have in the past and we're likely to in the future. There was a study of uh, serolimus and rapamycin to see if we can switch your immunosuppression to see if it would delay the onset of kidney complications, right? So a lot of people have kidney complications. And that study um, didn't pan out. But, um, but another one will for sure come up. And when it does, we will let you know. <laughs> Do you think there will come a day where the farther after you are, the anti-rejection medication will, you will say, you don't need it anymore? That's, I, mean, I know that's a trick question. Uh, that's, go ahead. You go with that. I wouldn't say that's where, so if you follow trajectories of, of care, I would say I don't expect it. Okay? That, that's my honest answer. I, I think that um, it's not impossible. We know in other organs like the liver, it is possible to get close to a third of people off their immunosuppression, but there's real differences in, in the type of immune cells that the liver carries versus what the heart carries, so I don't expect it, but I'd love to be pleasantly surprised. So what you're so then if I can, what you're basically saying is that all of us in this room, um, we can expect that our bodies will never fully, fully say, this is now my heart, belongs to me. If you want to put it that way, so that's my expectation. Henry. So you have the patient at the train center and request to have their heart put in the door and take it home. Would you do it? No, we can't. And, and so it turns out that's where the pathologist will uh, say, no, this is actually our heart. 
part of what you sign when you consent to the procedure. It's in the fine print on the, on the, on the surgical pathology or the, the procedure note is that, that your explanted tumor, organ, whatever, actually belongs to the Department of Pathology. You don't really know. <laughs> <laughs> there were public you mean the one at Temple, right? So that was a study, uh, so uh, Ms. Bullock asked about a bone marrow study that was designed to induce tolerance and help people get off their, all of their immunosuppression uh, and also perhaps delay the uh, complications related to that. And it was a part of a NIH-funded multi-investigator effort at Temple and it got a couple publications, but it was not definitive in terms of inducing tolerance. Um, and I still think it's a promising idea, this idea of what we call microchimerism, where you train the recipient's immune system and like to consider this, uh, the proteins from the donor as self. But it, it, it's stalled, to my knowledge. I'm sure most of the people in here are uh, good pill takers uh, when it comes to the picture today. Yeah. Why here. But you must have feedback on other people who maybe abuse uh, their medication uh, and or don't take it at all. Do you get any feedback at all in those uh, cases of to how they survive uh, or whether they do survive? Um, we, we certainly have annex, so it's not a topic of Organize a prospective research because we that wouldn't be ethical to say we're going to take some of you and have you be bad pill takers and some of you <laughs> some bodies at the end. We're not you know we can't do that stuff. Um, we have anecdotes of people who wind up in the hospital or on hospital service and they find out that either they were nauseated from some viral infection and they couldn't keep their pills down for a number of days and sure enough they're in rejecting uh, or. Um, they were not compliant, as you say, or inconsistently compliant, and came in with a very low or undetectable prograph level or whatever it is. And, and so we have anecdotes that lead to my previous answer that I don't expect it. But we have, it's not been a prospective research topic because it's just not ethical to do it. Just Butler, you had a question? Yeah. Um, at the end of our life, uh, is there any studies on the heart that was given to us afterwards for post-studying or post-research? Um, we have, um, I'm, I'm not involved in that. As much human heart tissue work as we've done, we've probably collected, you know, upwards of 800 hearts now from the big centers I've been at. Uh, we have none that would be in a non-surgical situation. Because one of the things I mentioned, the whole business about the cardioplegia here, is that the tissue quality really degrades if it's not protected in that way. So for the types of things we usually study, um, we've not. Now that being said, I can imagine other types of research that don't necessarily require quite the same degree of tissue preservation could be enabled by that. It's just not the stuff I'm doing here. As a follow-up to that, it's not a pleasant thing to think about, but, but um, you can have um, a, a limited autopsy performed, and the Department of Pathology can take the heart, and we do learn uh, from examining those hearts to see what, what went wrong, which arteries had problems, et cetera, et cetera. So that is an option, and it's a completely voluntary option, of course, but that is something you can do. I didn't get asked about it, so I volunteered, but I I don't remember seeing any paperwork to that effect. It would, something, it would be something to ask your family at the time. Well, you can have mine. I don't plan on going soon, but... Okay. <laughs> you got that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot of us do, a lot of us do groups. And one question that always comes up is, can your transplant heart be that always comes up, you know, well, you've got this heart, when you pass, when you get to that point where you get ready to pass away, can they transplant the heart that was transplanted to me into somebody else? It, usually the hearts at that point are not suitable. They're not in suitable shape to be in somebody else. You know, they have problems with the arteries or problems from old rejection. I have never heard of a case. Have you ever heard of a case where a heart's been no, re-transplanted? I, 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 
I think there are a couple of cases like that. There's even more cases where other organs from organ transplant recipients, so let's say your kidneys, you know, uh, get transplanted from a heart recipient. It's, it's very rare for a transplanted organ to get retransplanted. It's less rare for a non a native organ from a transplant recipient to get transplanted. The only place I've ever heard is when the transplanted organ fails almost immediately. And so they still have a good organ to transplant. And if they can get a, another donated organ, they sometimes recover that. But seldom with hearts. The other organs more so. Thank you. After you pass on, you can donate your body to the medical school. Yes. And there'll be research on your heart. Because you know, I, I did it. I donated my body. I'm coming here. No hurry, buddy. No hurry. No, no, no. We can wait. We're, we're very patient in that regard. <laughs> Go ahead. You had a question. Uh, yes. With rejection, um, when you're done with biopsies, is it, I mean, because I was all new to this the way I went into heart transplant. Um, I had no heart health issues. After you're done with biopsies, how about rejection after that long term? Do you just wait for symptoms? Do you, is it checked through our blood work we get every six months? The, the, the reason, and, and the different centers around town may vary a little bit, but the reason that biopsies get stopped after a certain amount of time is that in people who take their medicines, right? If, if, if you don't take your medicines, all bets are off. They really are. If people take their medicines that go, let's say, three years out, and they've had a bland rejection history, their likelihood of picking up a true rejection on a subsequent biopsy is really low. They stop doing it because the risk is low. Again, providing you're taking your medicine. Um, so it's not that, and so, well, could it happen? It could happen, but the, but the risks of surveillance biopsies are not worth it at that point. But the, yes, it is symptoms. If you ever get symptoms, you know, that you were doing functionally well, and now you have limits that you didn't have before, it always has to be investigated. If you're having a passing out spell and you never had that before, it always has to get investigated. I mean, that's part of the things that by three years out, you know, the survivors have learned that they have to report symptoms um, so we can figure it out. Maybe rejection, maybe some separate problem, but either way, it has to be ferreted out. I have a question. Okay. Who approves uh, the research studies? Or do you have to have approval? Is it the board? Is it NIH? Now, that's a great question. So, um, every institution has an institutional review board, and this is mandated by government. And the history behind institutional review boards is quite fascinating and troubling. It goes all the way back to the Nuremberg trials and to the Tuskegee uh, uh, debacle. Uh, and the goal of institutional review boards is to prevent that kind of unregulated human experimentation. So an institutional review board is comprised of uh, people uninvolved with your research who have the expertise to judge the risks and benefits of the research, including people who are non-physicians. Um, so, and that is mandated. So, uh, all of our research has been vetted uh, by the Institutional Review Board, and Penn has an aggressive Institutional Review Board, um, and we, they never, you send them something and they always have a question and you have to go back and forth until they give you their approval, and you have to report to them uh, every year and get renewed to make sure there is no change in safe risk to patients. That's one level of regulation. If the study involves a funding agency, such as the government or an industry sponsor, they too have oversight and want to see progress and evidence of safety and that you're doing the study well. Uh, finally, if the study involves uh, a new drug or new device, uh, the Food and Drug Administration regulates uh, those studies as well and wants to see that uh, things are done safely and appropriately. And this is all part of the federal law. So it's highly regulated. Even if it's an observational study where there really is minimal risk, it still gets vetted by these different boards. I do not think there's religious group oversight. I think that gets to separation of you know, church and state. Um, but, 
again, research is never required. So if you have specific religious reservations or any reservations, you, you don't have to do it. I just found the board. On the board, that's a good question. I do not believe they have. I, I don't think they have clergy. I, I, I actually they, think some IRB. I think that varies. It's not a. So the regul you know, there's regulations about what IRBs must be composed of, and I don't think it mandates clergy, but I think many IRBs do have clergy represented. <laughs> One of the groups, ABC, ABC, CBS, you know, a very famous... Art Kaplan? Yes. Yeah, he's a bioethicist, yes. Yeah. I think someone with his knowledge base, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you all for coming. Go ahead. I just want to say thank you, and I think you all do a, a wonderful job at presenting research and dumbing it down enough so I can understand it. Uh, I appreciate that. Um, and there, I know there's something that doctors are always, always, always reluctant to talk about. And that is what else we can do when we say research. But there's other things besides research that the institution needs. And that's money. And as a group of people that have been given this amazing gift, we can all work hard if we can't afford it ourselves, maybe to find someone else to make contributions to this organization, to some organization, gift of life, second chance, whatever. Um, I know you're reluctant to talk about it. I know HIPAA has issues as well that makes it difficult, but that's something with the government doing less and less and less for you and expect even less in the future. Um, we as a group have to get active to making sure that this can go on. Well, let me take you back off that if I may. One, to express again our special appreciation for your time. And we have an inspiration 365 days a year of inspiration with DVDs in the back to keep you inspired. <laughs> 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 off of what you just said. There's a lot of ways that we can help beyond what we're saying here, as you said, certainly within this institution, but just about every level of oversight, support, organization has patients included. And so, speaking from personal experience, I've been on the UNOS Thoracic Transplantation Committee, which is the one that makes the rules of exactly how we got our hearts. Work with these kind of doctors in a, a volunteer group of about 20 that meet regularly and make these studies and make recommendations. Absolutely fascinating to be a patient voice in that. At first, very intimidated, then I realized they've never had one, they've only done them. You know? <laughs> That's true. <laughs> From there, ended up on the membership professional standards committee of units, which is the one that says whether this institution can even do transplants and sit in on those reviews and vote on activities that affect these programs. An individual patient, can you imagine that? Thirdly, uh, most recently, I've actually been elected to the board of UNO. So I sit on their board for three years, looking at, from that level, everything that goes on with transportation. Let me tell you, it's a very complex world, but my point is not that I'm there. My point is, there's places for each of us to help out to be a gift of life, Steve, an active volunteer for the Gift Life Family House, as an example, uh, is over there all the time, helping patients who stay there along with others. And a more fascinating experience I had recently was being invited on a peer review group at the government level, in fact, the Department of Defense level, of reviewing grant applications. How do I know about that? <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, with the people in the room, we got to discuss and make decisions about rating all the aspects of these grants so that another higher level, which also has patient representation, they decide who's going to get the millions of dollars to carry out the research. That was fascinating too. Again, my point is there are opportunities for each of us to play a role even beyond what's been described here. And so sometimes those come through the organizations that we represent here, so by being members uh, when I got that call about the peer review, they were looking for transplant recipients. 
who would sit on these boards, and by the way, get paid to do it. <laughs> we went to Washington and paid four hundred fifty dollars a day to sit in a high tech room with twenty other people voting, discussing. Actually, fascinating, especially coming from where we come from. So I just want to share that with you, give you that thought. You can be part of that. Again, our pleasure. Thank you to our social worker team who have developed into this whole Washington. Debbie, thank you. And he's gold. There you go. <laughs> Own your dreams, Claudia. <laughs> and Sally, finding joy. Simple secret to a happy life. Thank you very much.